Uh, welcome to Deloitte. Uh, my name is Steve Galucci. I'm the managing partner of our office here in New York. Uh, and as you take your seats, it's my job here to welcome you uh, and welcome uh, all of our guests uh, to, to Deloitte this morning. Uh, and I do that on behalf of my partners, my partner, Dippy Galati, one of your United Way New York City board members, as well as my other partners and all the people at Deloitte. It's really a privilege for us to be able to host this today. Uh, today's a bit of a somber day, uh, given the events of yesterday. Uh, and uh, not to make too much about, about yesterday, but I think it's worth noting that when we heard the news yesterday and we read the accounts of what happened, uh, obviously uh, what was be behind the, this horrific accident wa was an attack, attack on our way of life, uh, attack on, 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 on our community, attack on, on how we live our lives on a, on a daily basis. Uh, and, and how we live our lives on a daily basis and the organizations that you represent and work for and the one that I'm privileged to work for represent what, what, what we're here to talk about today, which is all that's good about society, which is, which is a, an inclusive society. Uh, and inclusion is something that's really very, very important to us. Uh, and, and this is the reason that we, we, we are part of the United Way of New York City and part of the United Way worldwide uh, and other organizations which many of you represent today. Uh, so this is a very, very important topic for us and I think very, very, very timely in that respect. And I'm really, really pleased to have our panelists join us. We have a wonderful panel that you'll hear from. Uh, the topic of inclusion is one that at Deloitte uh, we, we, we talk about a lot, but I think we do more than that. We put into action. Uh, and uh, we've done a number of things at a firm level and certainly here in our community here. Uh, you'll hear a little bit about it later. Uh, we, 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 we stood up an inclusion council. Uh, the, the concept of, of diversity and inclusion obviously is not a new, new concept. Uh, some would argue that diversity is easier, easier than inclusion, and the inclusion part is the part that we really work hard, hard to get right. And, and by no means do, do, I, do I think that we at Deloitte have it right, um, but we're addressing it, uh, and it's something that I think we're making progress on. So uh, and when, when the data is, is clear, you know, when you have a diverse group, a diverse set of opinions from, from diverse backgrounds, you arrive at better decisions, more thoughtful decisions. Uh, and better outcomes. So, so that's what we're here to talk about today. Uh, I'll I'll see to the to the panel in a minute. But uh, it's my job, actually. So you think about those attributes: thoughtful, uh, strong. Uh, those are attributes that you hear a lot about Sheena, right? I think you'd all agree with that. Mm -hmm. Sheena is all that and more. Uh, we are privileged and proud to call Sheena a partner of ours here at Deloitte. Uh, she's frequently noted as as one of the the most most powerful and Im influential uh, business people in New York City, uh, and I can attest to that, and I think many of you can too. So, without further ado, Sheena Wright. I am bringing him with me wherever I go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Steve. And we are so proud and pleased to be in partnership with Deloitte uh, globally. It is a very important institution, not only in our city. Uh, but across the world in terms of really being thought leaders and lending their uh, strategic advisory services and consulting services to really help solve, I think their, their tagline is the wicked problems. And we do have some wicked problems that we need to solve. I'm going to be very brief and just really say thank you. I have to say I'm a little surprised. When my team came to me and said, you know, we want to do this discussion about diversity and inclusion, I said, really? Do pe are people, aren't they kind of, do they really want to come? We, I mean, over 250 RSVPs for this event. I was really taken aback. And what I appreciate is that, obviously, this is a pressing and burning issue. And just based on who I am, we can, I think, hopefully appreciate that it's, it's something that's meaningful and important to me. But that so many people want to solve the challenge and solve the issue and come together. And that's why I'm so grateful, quite frankly, for an institution like United Way of New York City. Just to get a sense who's in the room, we have leaders and people from the corporate sector, the nonprofit sector, and the government sector all here together to have this conversation. I think what happens so frequently is that we have conversations with ourselves in a bubble, in our own silos, and that's why the problems that face us seem so intractable. And because we sit at the intersection of those three very important communities, it is our obligation and responsibility to bring us all together, because this is where we solve the problem. So my charge to you uh, today, certainly we have wonderful panelists who have 
really donated their time and, and their talent to help us think through these issues. Uh, we're very grateful for Errol Lewis to moderate the discussion. But my charge to you is to really participate. Uh, we want to hear from you. We want to have a dialogue at Deloitte. Um, and we also want people to leave here with some actionable steps to take. Actionable steps to take. So as you're here, as you're engaged, as you're listening, think to yourself, well, what is my assignment? What am I going to do when I leave this place to help solve this problem and to help solve this challenge? So buckle up, because I'm sure it's going to be very interesting and exciting and illuminating. And I want to introduce Errol Lewis. I mean, he is one of the esteemed journalists of our time. Um, he is, you know, I watch him every night on New York once. <laughs> uh, uh, and I, he's, it's, it's, you know, the election is coming up in... Uh, what? Six days. Six days. So, but he was able to carve out some time to come and, and help us lead this discussion. So, Errol, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheena. And uh, good morning to everybody. And uh, the election is indeed um, next Tuesday. So, um, please be ready for that. Um, I, I have, a, um, I have a, a short commercial for New York One News. Um, if you have cable... Uh, we, we just expanded, so you're, we're seeing in the five boroughs for sure. If you have cable, not FiOS, cable. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we uh, we recently added two million households to our footprint. So if you are in Nassau, if you are in Suffolk County, if you are in Westchester County, if you are in North Jersey, and you have cable, uh, Channel 98, please watch. So um, I am so glad to be here. Last year's discussion was, was fantastic. This year's is even more pressing. I think it's, it's, um, it's fair to say that it's on, uh, it's on everybody's minds uh, that we are at a point where you all as leaders are going to need to step up. I hope it has occurred to you as you watch the events of the world unfold. I'm going to have to do something about this. Whatever I had as my career path, I'm going to have to put something else on the agenda. I'm going to have to get involved. I will mention in passing, for example, there was a tweet this morning from somebody in Washington, D.C., <laughs> um, which pointed out that the suspect in yesterday's terrorist attack uh, entered the country through a particular diversity lottery uh, program. This person in Washington was disparaging the whole idea of it. And this person is in a position to sort of set uh, the, 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 the conversation in a different direction. So um, we're all in this together, not just next election day, but every day. And I hope that today will be an important part of uh, helping everybody kind of figure out what you believe, what you believe in, where it's going to take you, not just professionally, but also uh, as a participant in our democracy. So with, with uh, having said all of that, um, let me uh, introduce each panelist, and as they come up, um, you are welcome to uh, applaud. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great group, and we're going to have a great discussion, and we're going to invite you to join us in the discussion in, uh, toward the, the middle of it. Rosevely Marquez Morales is the East Coast Diversity Director of Sidley Austin. <laughs> Jeffrey Wallace is the President and CEO of Leaders Up, an employer-led uh, a group that uh, specializes in employer-led solutions to youth unemployment and opportunity gaps nationwide. <laughs> Karen Twaronite is a, a partner for a global diversity and inclusiveness officer at EY. She's also a board member here at uh, the United Way. Thank you for joining us, Karen. <laughs> Roger Ariel, the hometown favorite, audit and assurance partner here at Deloitte, <laughs> New York. <laughs> And uh, Sheena Wright, who made all of this possible and is, of course, the reason I am here. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Sheena. So um, as, as the hometown favorite, Roger, you get the first question. And I, for you know, panelists, we're, we're sitting town hall style for a reason. Just jump in if you've got something to add um, or dispute uh, or, or um, clarify. But this um, current political climate that I alluded to, Roger, um, really kind of goes uh, to the, the heart of the question that we're, we're tackling today. Inclusiveness, diversity, and uh, we have a sort of a, a national dialogue going on that is really 
taking us in a different direction. I should have passed out the mics if you guys came up. Um, just hand, hand that to Roger. Yeah. Uh, make the connection between the conversation we were planning for weeks to have and this political climate. Why is it more important than ever for us to be addressing issues of diversity and inclusion? Thank you, Earl. And before I start, I know you each have a program, and I want to. Um, indicate that I do, in fact, have educational uh, credentials. I think I'm the only one within the book here. So I'm a graduate of <laughs> uh, Baruch College MBA from uh, Columbia Business School. So going back to the question at hand, I, I think it's, it's critically important that uh, individuals stay attuned to where it is that we are as a country. And within my firm, Deloitte, that's exactly what we've done. We've, we've continued to team and support our people. We've continued to encourage them to be their authentic selves, uh, given some of the, the horrific incidences that we've noted within our country, it becomes critically important that we remain supportive of all of our people and allow them to be their authentic selves, because without that, we'd have a very, very divisive, divisive Deloitte. We'd have a very, very divisive um, country, essentially. So it. The short answer is it's critically important that we continue to stay together uh, despite what it is that's going on. And we see that there are extremes on both sides. And when I say both sides, I mean that you have the, the white supremacist on one side and you have the other side. And, and that's not where we want to be. We want to be as a country, as um, an organization. We want to be supportive of everybody. And, and Rosabli, I mean, you, your, your firm in particular is right in the middle of sort of the bloodstream of, uh, of national political debate. Very high-powered um, uh, clients and discussions and, and litigation. Um, the mood of the country changes from time to time. We're at a point now where there's a fair number of people who are pushing back against the notion of diversity and inclusiveness. How does that change the, the conversation, or does it? It shouldn't change the conversation. Uh, I think one of the important things to, to remember, if, if you're looking at it from the corporate side, I, I, I direct people's attention to the recent letter that uh, you know, 25 of the Fortune 500 companies wrote to Speaker Ryan. Uh, on, on that political side, what they said to them was 72% of our workforce are being affected by DACA and what's happening. So regardless of whether or not you are feeling the conversation and you feel you should be engaged, your workforce these are, their, these are your people. So it's definitely a conversation that we have to continue to have, and it's definitely a conversation that we have to continue to push forward. And at Sidley, we're working harder now, because we recognize that what's happening politically um, is affecting our, our all of the people that we service, just in terms of our clients, but also our own attorneys. Um, we have attorneys of you know, all diverse backgrounds that we're working with, um, and also our pipeline. I mean, some of the work that I do in particular, it focuses on building and empowering the diverse pipeline. And it's not just for the legal profession, but just for the industry as a whole. We're mm -hmm. focusing on cultivating professionals. And part of that cultivating is working together and making sure that we have an inclusive environment for them to be able to thrive at, for any individual to thrive at. So it's very important that we pay attention and, and it's very important that we engage, that we engage not just by listening, but by being active within our own sectors. And, and uh, so, Jeffrey, there's, there's carrots and sticks in, in all of this discussion. Um, I think of much of your work, both when you were at the Urban League in Los Angeles and the work that you're doing now, as really intended to sort of um, help people, sh sh help show people that there's a way out of these perennial issues. I mean, I was writing about youth unemployment my first professionally published story in 1984. Um, you know, and you could, all you have to do is change the stats just a little bit and put in a new date, and here we are today dealing with some of the same issues. How, how does uh, your work fit into this national debate? Well, when we look at the uh, future and current labor market of the U.S., we know that millennials will make up 50% by 2020, and about 30 to 40% of baby boomers are exiting um, and taking with them the skill sets and technical uh, capabilities necessary for us to drive American business forward. So this is more um, an issue around our business competitiveness and our global, um, uh, our global economy as well. When we think about the 5.5 million young people in America that are out of school and out of work, 70% of those young people are young people of color. 
And as we move to a multicultural majority across this nation, currently everyone under the age of nine is already dealing with, are already living in a multicultural dominant society. That is our future consumer base. So this is not just about the nice thing to do, but this is actually an economic imperative when we think about multicultural buying power being, has grown over 410% in the last decade, and it's growing even more so. So our future of our economy is depending upon us being inclusive. I like to coin the phrase that an inclusive economy is a competitive, a competitive economy. And when we think about this, this is not just you know, our diversity and inclusion strategy as a corporate social responsibility ploy. This is how businesses uh, no longer uh, move from a transition from being blockbuster to Netflix. The business leaders that are actually looking, uh, not just looking ahead, but seeing around corners are understanding how can we be more inclusive to optimize the performance and productivity of our business strategy. Mm. And, and so, Karen, how, how, do we, how do you change the culture? You, you have been um, the winner of awards and recognition for having changed corporate cultures. Um, it's it's got to be frustrating on one level, um, but no what... Problem. What's the, well, 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 well I mean, I, I say that meaningfully. I mean, the, the, you know, one of the things in my business is you, you, you do all of the research, you interview every relevant person, you lay out a whole series of stories and investigations about what will happen if certain policies don't change, and it's published and nothing changes. And then exactly what was predicted happens with almost predict scientific precision. You know, it just rolls right down you know, the, the education policy, the resilience policy for the environment, whatever it might be. Um, and I'm sure you think, as I sometimes think, if people had only listened to me, I had laid out for you, you know, uh, in explicit detail how to make things change. But of course, it's, it's much more complex for, for you. How do you make it happen? So, uh, and, and thank you for the comments. And, and we've made progress, but we've got a long way to go too. And it's hard for us too. Uh, but we, we have um, some, some pieces that I would suggest if others were thinking about this, probably not unique to EY. Um, having a roadmap, tone at the top, accountability, real recognition and rewards around that. And I don't mean only negative, I mean positive rewards. Um, as well as talking about why it matters for business, so exactly what you were talking about. Uh, and, and we know for a fact that diversity and inclusion as it relates to teams and our business is imperative for growth, innovation, risk prevention, seeing around corners um, to be able to uh, solve really complex problems of our, of our customers and our clients. So we've made that case based on business perspective. But I also wanted to share that we were talking about social issues. We used to be able to um, say, "Well, this is only about business. This is not, you know, this is not solely for a so social justice cause." One of the things that I think is actually making it easier is that we need to have the social piece in it, in it as well, and we can be we don't have to be embarrassed about that. Mm -hmm. We can be very explicit about that, and that's not alone for our company. That um, things like xenophobia is at an all-time high right now. The conversations need to be happening at companies. I'll, I'll take you back that. A few years ago, you would say, well, this is one issue that we deal with at work, and this is one issue that we deal with outside of work. And maybe we dabble for those of us that are involved with the, with the communities and want to do more and expand. But, you, you know, we would keep that gray area. Now we operate and live in that gray area every day. And I think that makes us better, and it allows us to contribute to, to a higher level. And then as it relates to our employees as a sample employee base, and as an example, we have 9,000 people here in New York City. Um, similar to, to, to Deloitte, um, we're now people's community. And we're now operating where people don't feel very safe in some of their communities, but they feel safe in their EY community. And we didn't used to be that for people. Mm. Um, so we have a bigger role to play. And I believe that all of these conversations are actually um, helping us to be more for our employees and in addition to doing more with the community together. If I can jump in here, and uh, I think certainly um, certainly Karen's point in the question about how do you change culture, and so certainly appreciate the, the previous comments about the business case, the future, um, the processes and the steps and the tools that we need to use. But if I can just bring it back a little bit, and I think that, you know, to the reason we have a conversation and a challenge and an issue around diversity and inclusion in this country, because really the bedrock of our nation is rooted in sexism and racism, right? 
I mean, I majored in history at Columbia, and anyone who knows our history knows that we, be, we became the economic superpower that we did as quickly as we did because we subjugated masses of people, all women and people of color. Um, and, and, and you're able to do that because you get in the hearts and minds of people and suggest that um, my racial identity, my gender, makes me you know, X or entitled to or this, so that you have this complete imbalance, right, as we grow as a nation in opportunity. You know, the number of women who are CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, people of color, on and on, this is, this is a part of just kind of our DNA and who we are. So in order to really tackle and address and, and deal with the issues, one, we, I think we have to recognize and realize that. And you said, how do you change culture? And, and, and we know the business case in, in 2040, right, the, the numbers when the, the people of color in this country become you know, the majority. But, but how do you really get to the hearts and minds? Every single person in this room has been touched in some way, whether they know it or not, by racism and sexism and, and, the, and the history and the culture of this country. How do we build community? How do we come together? Um, I think in really trying to get to that, we have to appreciate the root of who we are. And, and it, that's just who we are. That's a fact. Um, and now what do we do about it? Mm. I, I don't want to pile on here, but I just want to say that we, we shouldn't look to guilt companies, individuals, or organizations. Uh, in the past, we've talked about it's the right thing to do, and the conversation ended there. And I think the movement is really not only is it the right thing to do, but it's the only thing to do if you want to survive yeah. as an organization as well. So we do look at this from a bottom line perspective as well. And I think that argument, when that is put forth, that that is very compelling. Can I also mention one other thing, Errol, that I think has been helpful in working with, because people are human. And, and one of the things that, in addition to people's experience, is also to reflect on human behavior. We know that people gravitate towards likeness, meaning to to spend time with people that look and feel like themselves because their brains are uh, what they refer to as people are cognitive misers, um, also referred to as lazy brain. And I don't mean to imply that people are lazy. <laughs> Efficient, shall <laughs> but we they say. Want, yeah. but, they want a, but they want a more seamless, easier feeling. Yeah. And they've found that those that um, have put discipline around um, you know, getting diverse perspectives, they're more accurate more of the time. The counter to that point and something that we talk about is um, that you actually don't want that easier feeling. You want the bumpiness because that's the benefits of what diversity might um, might bring to the table. The counterpoint to that is homogeneous teams are less accurate more of the time, but they feel very confident in their level of accuracy. <laughs> so another aspect that is appealing to, to try to um, not blame or shame anybody, but to just say, can, you know, reflect on that, lean towards the bumpy, lean towards the more difficult, because it's better for business, but it's also uh, better all around. How, how do you do that, though, and at the same time um, bring forward and sort of make real this value of empathy, which is one of the strategies that's often talked about to sort of um, help people understand? I mean, it's one thing to have this a uh, person from a different background on your team, in the room with you, uh, you're, you're, you're kicking ideas around. You also, though, need to sort of put yourself in their shoes to really kind of understand what it's all about. Right, Jeffrey? Absolutely. I mean, I think this is something that is a call for leadership, um, to really understand from an empathetic standpoint the uh, implications of someone's social economic background, their ethnic diversity, gender, et cetera, you want to maximize your team. And maximizing your team is understanding the triggers as well as some of the things that will incentivize them to perform at a higher, um, at a higher plateau. So I think this is also about us just being curious about understanding with a capital U, the background that people come from and how that could actually contribute to, again, moving strategy forward, moving the business imperative forward around this. And I think um, part of this, again, is this balance between doing good and doing well. And we've seen businesses across the nation internationally really wrap their arms around this as something that's going to sharpen their strategy moving forward into the markets that they want to penetrate. I had, the, I had the pleasure uh, not too long ago of attending the GLOBE uh, conference, and I had never attended it in the past, and I attended as an ally. And I view myself to be very open-minded, 
and I, and I suggested to a group of individuals that, you know, why do I care who it is that you're attracted to? I'm heterosexual, you may be gay, you may be a lesbian, and I really don't care. I want teams that view things the way I do, that you are indifferent. And, and the response back was, was very, uh, was very startling to me in that, well, we don't want you to be indifferent because perhaps we're not going to perform as well as we could um, had you not had the view of indifference and perhaps had a view of embracing us and desiring us to be on the account. And, and they use an example and say, well, let's say you have your team and you have uh, a team that is performing well, but on one side, one side you have an anti-Semite, on another you have a homophobe, and on another you have a white supremacist. And everybody's performing well, but uh, personally, they hate each other. You know, could we perform a lot better? Could we perform exceptionally well to the extent we all embrace each other versus we are indifferent towards each other? So it was very startling to me to hear that. And, and whereas in the past I spoke about ambivalence towards one's sexual preference, um, I've changed in that regard. And I've learned that no, ambivalence tolerance is not enough but rather let's embrace each other. I just want to add that what, you know, we, we talk about it coming from the top and management down, and sometimes it's a lot easier to get management on board, but what, where we lose it is in the implementation of the process, right? So we really have to talk about what happens at the middle level and how does that message get implemented. And part of it is that companies have to take into consideration that you have to provide training in this space. You can't expect that we're as human beings, we're going to be empathetic. Yes, we are. But if people are not comfortable having the conversation and are afraid to have the conversation because they may say the wrong thing, they may do the wrong thing, and they may feel like you know they could insult someone, or maybe I'm going to say someone something, somebody's going to say that I got harassed, you know. So we as as companies have to provide them with those tools to be able to have those conversations in a meaningful way so that the message is authentic. It can't be well. This is what management wants us to do, so this is what we're going to do. Because the person on the other end that's receiving that message is just hearing like. This is not really that important to you. You're just doing this because that's what you're being told to do. But if you provide the proper training and it's an investment, but you're going to get a better investment and you're going to get a good return on that investment in the fact that your workforce is going to feel inclusive and engaged and they're going to feel like you authentically care and therefore I'm going to give you my all, right? Because you're going to want to uplift the people that uplift you. And so that will start to happen organically. So we really do have to focus on how the message gets implemented and what's happening at the middle level. You, you really have to build that architecture though, right, counselor? I mean, because because there's a, there's a whole range of legal sanctions and that, that stuff is very well developed and people get training on that no matter what, that if you cross this line, you're gonna have a problem. Whereas trying to implement some of the values that you're talking about, there you, you're gonna to have to sort of build that ladder for people, right? Absolutely, and that's what I'm saying. You have to take the time to educate yourself on the primary issues, educate your staff that is sort of front line for you. They're your ambassadors, right? So, you know, anyone that comes into our company that we that goes out and speaks on our behalf is an ambassador for us. So whether it be the attorney, whether it be the receptionist. From, it's from the top to the bottom that you have to make sure that everyone is, is you know, just sort of saying your message and what is my message and who am I and what is my culture. Mm -hmm. And that culture has to be throughout across the company. And I think that's critical also for companies that are really engaging multicultural millennials and Gen Z as well. Because as you know, millennials, I'm a millennial, uh, we come to the world of work with a certain set of expectations. And managers, specifically frontline managers, and we will be 50% of the workforce by 2020, so <laughs> businesses should get used to that. Um, but managers, frontline managers, are your linchpin around one of the most important metrics that you are really looking at, and that's your retention rate. Now, we think about the intersection of millennials and their retention and the, inter and the gig economy and just the way of the new um, economy that we're what we're working in, it's important that those frontline managers are equipped with the skills to engage and optimize the productivity of their teams. Critical. And I'm talking about capital D diversity where it's not just ethnic and gender, but uh, generational. One manager is managing probably three to four generations at once with completely different expectations of what the world of work and the culture of the company should be. Um, and what we found in our research and Pilka research of working with 70 plus multinational companies across the nation is that young people are quitting their managers and not their jobs. 
So it's critical, mm. critical that we ensure this if we're going to have some type of business continuity and continue performance from a diversity inclusion standpoint that that frontline manager is actually well equipped and empowered to lead um, with a level of inclusive. Inclusivity. I want to say, if, if, uh, if you haven't seen it already, the, uh, the Fortune uh, article in the October issue, um, the, the Black Ceiling, um, really very instructive. The focus is on black women and uh, in the upper reaches of Fortune 500 companies, why there are so few, uh, what, what steps are being taken. Um, and, and Sheena, the, 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 the statements by Ursula Burns, in some ways the article was built around her and her departure from Xerox. Um, she for, she's a hometown heroine for a lot of us, right? She comes from the projects on the Lower East Side, goes to Catholic school, gets herself, you know, on board at Xerox and gets herself all the way uh, to the corner office. Uh, but she makes, she makes some statements in that article that struck me as um, either generationally tone deaf or I just, I, I wasn't quite sure what you would think of it and wanted to get your, your feedback on it, where she says, look, there's only, you, you got to manage uh, uh, people and money in high profile divisions of your corporation or you're not going to make it to the top. You know, she says human resources isn't going to do it. And, you know, marketing isn't going to do it. I, I was stru struck by that. I was thinking, that sounds like maybe the reflection of what went on at Xerox as opposed to broader lessons that people can take about how to sort of uh, move in their own companies. It was definitely an interesting and a provocative piece, and I think uh, I think the fact is, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, there are zero African American women at, at at the moment who are CEOs, right, of a Fortune 100 company. She was the only one, and with her departure, that's why kind of the article was mm. like, you know, there are there are none. I think it's I mean, Fortune, maybe it's the Fortune 500. I mean, it's 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 a big it's a big number. Um, so, you know, I think what she was saying, I mean, and she is, um, I mean, I can't imagine what she had to do and endure and kind of go through. And I think what she was saying is you, you have to, you know, there, there might be systems and structures and processes and training and all of that, but you've got to take your career and your forward progression into your own hands. And you've got to advocate to make sure that you have the appropriate leadership and authority um, and really be extremely thoughtful about your steps and making sure that you have mentors and, 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 and um, sponsors and all of those things. And I think that was really from the nature of, of her own experience. So I do think absolutely there is an um, imperative for companies to do things differently. And certainly there has to be you know, stuff at the top that gets set in terms of tone. But there's something that everybody can do, whatever level you're in, certainly if you are you know, uh, focused on your own career and progression. But also, I mean, just I want to say a little word about empathy. And I just want to make sure empathy is not sympathy. Empathy is not sympathy. Empathy is a curiosity and an interest uh, in someone else and really trying to genuinely understand where someone is coming from. Anybody can do that. Everybody can do that. And, and that should be you know, kind of one of your takeaways. I'm going to get to know someone in my organization who's not like me, and just get to know them. And that helps to create a, a, a better appreciation and understanding and inclusion. That helps overcome um, what Karen talked about in terms of, I just really want to be people who are around people who are like me. But now I know something about my colleagues that I didn't know before. And so creating the opportunities for that. So, you know, like joining groups and organizations inside and outside your company. But, um, but I do think um, that there are real challenges across, and not just in the corporate sector. There are challenges in government. There are challenges in the nonprofit sector when you talk about leadership. Um, you know, the United Way network across the country has very few people of color at its helm. Mm. I'm the first woman to lead United Way of New York City in 80 years. Um, so, yeah, right. <laughs> like, like, you know, that's like kind of a long time. That's a big deal. Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> so these problems are endemic across sectors. And I think what Ursula was saying is, you know, you can't wait for the institution or the sector to adjust to you. There's some things that you're going to have to do and be very, you know, and she was very aggressive about it, mm -hmm. and that, that got her to be successful in order to, to get to where you need to be. And, and Karen, I mean, something like empathy of, of the kind that 
Sheen was just describing, that's not something you uh, sort of, you know, put on with your, you know, your, t your tie in the morning and, and go up to work, right? It's, it's, in some ways, it's a sort of a personal choice, personal values, and a lifestyle. Is that something companies should be screening for um, or talking more about internally as something that they want coming in the front door? Certainly, I will tell you, in, in the people that we look to hire, we're more inclined to hire people with um, curiosity, agility, resilience, um, empathy. And those are difficult things to uncover, but we, we would be more inclined to hire people that have a predisposition towards um, learning and understanding versus a 4.0000 mm -hmm. uh, person, uh, you know, in, in their portfolio. And I would tell you that's different than what we might have looked for 20 years ago. And it's essential for our business that people would have that understanding. But, but one of the things that we're very clear about is the concept of equitable sponsorship. Nobody does this alone. So whether you're Ursula or Sheena or, or any of us up here, it's not possible. Um, one, I think it's not possible you know, for one company to do it alone. I also think it's not possible for anyone, no matter their drive. Mm -hmm. They can't give themselves visibility or substantive work experiences that can catapult them up the line. Um, they can't give themselves promotions and raises and all of those mm -hmm. things to, to, to get opportunities. So I do think that it's important to emphasize that people need to sponsor people that look like them as well as people that don't look like them. Mm -hmm. We are very deliberate and specific in saying, so who do you sponsor? Who do you sponsor that looks like you? Who do you sponsor that doesn't look like you? Mm. And then we also make sure that you get recognized for that. The second piece that I would ch just talk about, because you were talking about tone at the middle, where things get kind of busted out. So I think many years ago, we used to talk about fixing certain people and offering programs for certain people versus fixing an environment. And, um, and I'm not saying that I'm proud of that, but it's certainly something that um, we've worked to do. One of the things that's been important for us in, in, the, in the middle and the whole organization is to emphasize the concept of belongingness and belonging. And that might sound like a super soft, squishy word, but it goes to your point on valuing uniqueness. And it's something that um, by valuing each person's uniqueness and allowing them to feel like they belong, we actually see real tangible business results. And then we also know from scientists that there's actual real health and mental uh, well-being results for employees. So um, focusing on what their unique differences, what they're bringing to the table, and that they feel a sense of belonging. And, and we also know that it's critically important in building trust. Mm -hmm. And um, as, as a differentiator, and you build that trust, you've got productivity, innovation, all of that stuff. But it's also really important. It's a win-win for employees as well. And I think it's been helpful in, as we're trying to tackle that, that middle so that people have a greater understanding. Just going back to the, the Ursula Burns article, I, I think it's important to note that many organizations have programs, but uh, without individuals participating in those programs, uh, you can check the box and say, yes, we have a DNI program, yes, we have this, yes, we have that, but it becomes meaningless to the extent individuals don't partake and are fully engaged, and that includes leadership, because leadership, in fact, participating in those programs will set the stage for the middle and the younger folks coming in as we recruit those individuals, they'll see that everybody is fully engaged. So it's not a check the box exercise that we have a program, we have a policy, but rather is everybody aware of the programs? Are they taking advantage of the programs? Are they fully engaged? And are individuals in leadership positions supportive of those individuals participating within those very programs? Well, I think emotional intel um, um, empathy is actually an indicator of just a depth of emotional intelligence that's necessary to really lead a team in the 21st century. And this emotional intelligence is something that we've been exercising for years to be effective. We call it executive functions. So this is not asking folks to do anything any di differently. It's actually act, uh, in employing that folks actually wield this emotional intelligence to create an ecosystem that's going to uh, produce high performance. And that's what this is about. We all have this as salespeople, as executives, as um, folks that are facilitators or what have you, where you have to be able to be responsive to the reaction that you're getting from your leadership. And that's what this is about, is leading with a level of emotional intelligence that is facilitating a, an inclusive environment where you can maximize 
the uh, performance of everyone on your team or everyone in your department or everyone in your in your borough. I'm in New York, so I have to say borough instead of count. <laughs> I'm a West Coast guy. But, um, you know, this is, and I'm up at it's 8 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning right Thank now. You, Jeff. <laughs> in Los Angeles. <laughs> Inclusivity at its best. Um, but um, I think it's really critical to call this as something, uh, to name it as what it really is. And this is calling leadership to be more emotionally intelligent as you are moving in the 21st century. It is not a nice to do. I sound like a broken record. This is the future. I live in California. Our future has been in color. You live in New York. You are already a minority majority marketplace. This is something that you need to do in order to thrive and not just survive in this burgeoning uh, global economy. Okay, we are gonna um, uh, take questions. Do we have uh, microphones circulating? Okay, so. Please signal, and um, while they are getting in place to give you your, to get our first questions going, I have one more for you, Ashina, which is uh, the the sort of cross sector conversation between the the philanthropic voluntary sector, uh, the public sector, yes. and the corporate sector. Uh, you've got lots of different uh, attempts to get at these issues from different sort of standpoints. How do you manage that, and what are the sort of the, the, the linchpins? What should people be looking for as a way to extend this conversation in an even more difficult way out to sort of a, places where there are different values, different structures? I think you know there's some certainly themes and um, foundational ideas that we've heard here in terms of um, emotional intelligence and, and making sure that there you have a level of curiosity. Um, you know, that you do get engaged. Uh, you know, it, diversity, I mean, I think every company has some sort of DNI initiative, and you don't have to be from a particular group to somehow be engaged. So to comp go back to your company and ask, you know, wh what are our um, programs here? How can I get involved? How can I, I get activated? And being curious and getting to know your colleagues. I think one of the other <laughs> things that we, that we didn't really touch on, in order to get to the diversity and inclusion that we want, we have to really build the pipeline. And one of the things that Ursula Burns said in that article is like, we have to start 20 years you know, back in making sure that people have the educational opportunities and the training and the, and the development in order to be available um, to be a part of these diverse pools that we want and need. So a, another thing to do is to how do we help continue to build the pipeline? for the future the workforce mm. and the future economy. And certainly United Way of New York City is doing a lot in that regard in terms of our work with education and, and helping uh, young people of color around the city who live in low-income communities get the skills and competencies that they need to be successful and to be the leaders of the future that we need them to be. Daryl, can I just add to that if I may? Because I think that we could all learn a lesson from what the United Way of New York City does as it relates to, say, the Read NYC program. You're trying to uh, address a real equity issue, yes. a real problem with reading uh, before, primarily before th third grade, right? Mm -hmm. All the way through. But what I think that we can all learn from all of you, from what the work that you're doing is that you're looking at the holistic ecosystem around that. You're not just solving that particular problem, you're helping the children with. Um, in addition to their reading and their school environment, dental, helping their parents with English as a second language, um, helping with financial <clears throat> assistance, preparation, taxes, so that you're rising up the entire ecosystem. That's incredibly complex, but you're you're allowing for a more sustainable pipeline in addition to solving real problems and something to be proud of, but I think also a lesson for all of us to take back to our own ecosystems um, as we're trying to solve problems as well. Question. Good morning. Um, so one of the things we are seeing a lot of in, in diversity and inclusion work right now is a pushback by white males, right? If you look at our panel, we don't see any white males. If you look around most of the room, I'm not looking behind me, but there are not a lot of white males in the room, right? Um, so we're seeing this pushback that they feel, not you know, to generalize, that this is a zero sum game we're playing, that if women win or people of color win or if LGBT win, white heterosexual males lose. How do you, how are you dealing with that in the work that you're doing uh, for the benefit of the audience? And what are some strategies that you've done or you've utilized 
to kind of make white males in particular feel that diversity is as much about them as it is about the other groups that we kind of default to when we talk about diversity and inclusion. And could you just identify yourself as well? Sure, I'm sorry. This is Chris Michelle. I'm from uh, Brown Brothers Harriman. So I'll, I'll start it off. And, and one of the things that we do here at Deloitte is we certainly have um, a whole host of affinity groups. So we have Ben Black Employee Network. We have Alpha. We have um, Ascend. We have all sorts of affinity groups, however, we decided that we were going to embark on a process whereby we'd set up inclusion councils. And inclusion councils are, are vehicles whereby um, those affinity group members, as well as others, inclusive of white males, can come and participate in a very safe environment and can learn and understand what it is that go what it is that's going on, as well as share information in terms of their views. So I think our approach towards it is really including white males as well in the discussion versus having separate silos whereby they're excluded. I just want to add that it's true there, there are no white males here but I, I, on the panel, but we're being there are supporters and there's allies here, so we want to just make sure that we acknowledge because I'm sitting here because our co-chair, Mike Schmittberger, who is a white male, is uh, our chair is co-chair of United Way. Uh, I also allude a lot of my success to my sponsor, who was an older white Jewish man. And so there are lots of white male allies in leadership that have allowed this conversation to drive and sort of implement. But I will say one of the things I'm hearing is sort of more on the millennial white male side of saying, because there's a lot of attention to the other groups, what's happening with us. So the message in terms of inclusivity is, is, is exact, right? That's what we're doing also. We're making sure that all of our initiatives are inclusive. When we host a DNI event, it's open to everyone at the firm, everyone to encourage. Our Associate Diversity Committee, we have different subcommittees. There's several white males who are participating as co-chairs and engaging in the conversation. So what we need to do is make sure that when we attend these type of events, we invite our white male colleagues to come and participate in the dialogue. Because what happens is sometimes the invitation is not being extended to them because they feel, well, I just, you know, this is, affects us and so we shouldn't. So, so we as individuals, in order to keep the dialogue going, have to engage with them and invite them to participate. But I will say that there are, I mean, a lot of white males participating on the panel, just not visually sitting here. So I, I want to acknowledge um, those that have been supporting and the, and the board here also mm. uh, that has been supporting these initiatives. Interesting. Yes, over here. Mm -hmm. I'm Jocelyn Rainey with the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Jocelyn Rainey with the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, so I think that this is great, and I'm glad we're having this conversation. And um, But I want to talk a little bit about the importance of formal programs and um, formal policies and initiatives in organizations beyond affinity groups and informal and voluntary programs. Um, the African Americans suffer double the unemployment. College graduates suffer double the unemployment of their white counterparts. And I think that a lot of that has to do with what Karen was talking about, the like me effect, that all of us feel more comfortable with folks that remind us of us. People want to work with people that they feel comfortable with, they can be friends with. And I think that there's a real importance in having these programs be formal around diversity hiring plans, diversity plans inside of organizations. And Karen, I thought that was great what you said about asking folks and then holding them accountable to who are you supporting beyond folks that look like yourself? And, and what are you doing and how do you measure that? So I'd like to hear a little bit more about your formal plans in mm -hmm. your organizations. Want to start? So we're accountants and consultants, so we really like metrics and we really like scorecards. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. No. So, <laughs> Uh, so we're really good at that. Uh, but that's actually a very good thing because then we can be very transparent about where we want to go, what we want to do. One underlying philosophy for us, um, and, and I'll, I'll share it with, with all of you, and it's, it's something that we hold true to, is the concept of propor proportionality. And so, you know, you can't hide behind proportionality in the sense that this is what the world looks like, this is what our world looks like, this is who works here of all different populations, and are they advancing proportionally? Are they getting, you know, because we measure everything, 
Are they getting the sexy learning experiences proportionally? Are they receiving sponsorship proportionally in addition to the more obvious things such as pay and promotions, et cetera? So those are things that we would measure all through the organization and hold ourselves accountable to that. We're not accountable to anybody else but ourselves. But that has really helped us to identify where we might have equity issues, where we might have management issues, where we might have a leadership issue, where we might have a supply issue, um, and, and to be able to target that very specifically. And then also to be able to um, have confidence that when we make progress and we're, when we're um, proportional plus, that, uh, that, that that'll allow, allow us to win. So that's a segment of accountability that's very substantive. And it also allows us to move beyond the concept of unconscious bias. Um, unconscious bias does exist, and there's good biases, bad biases. And they can impact this proportionality. And they can impact the ability to, to progress. But that's not an excuse. And, and our view is anything less than proportionality um, could be indicative of that. And that regardless, even if bias might exist, we're going to be better than that. And we're going to be better than that in any decisions that we make that imp impact people's lives and, um, and, and our firm. So I hope that helps as a start. One of the things um, I've been seeing across uh, the companies that we're working with is, um, well, it takes us back to this old saying, you show me your budget and you, sh um, show me your budget and you show me what you care about. So when we think about how are we actually incentivizing uh, leadership to actually demonstrate diversity, inclusion, and equity into their hiring practices, promotional practices, those things should be tied to performance reviews and actually your actual bonuses that are being paid out as well. But then you flip the PL and look at your expenses from a standpoint of where you're spending your money from a diverse supplier standpoint, that's also another indicator of how you can build a vertical of diversity and equity throughout any business strategy or any public sector to really reflect the economy and ecosystem that we're living in because it's those diverse suppliers that will then hire more diverse people so that we can address the root cause of that unemployment rate because at the end of the day, we don't have a larger pool of employers that reflect the population of the future so that they will have fair hiring practices as well. I want to say, just going back to your, your question, <coughs> accountability and measurement are, are keys. So we here at Deloitte, we have what uh, scorecards and we have goals and so forth, and we're held accountable for the achievement of those goals. And one, in the past, um, our work in this area has, has really been what I refer to as a night job. That you did your day job, which was client service, and then thereafter, if you had time or you're passionate about it, but it wasn't something that was recognized nor appreciated, or uh, nor rewarded, and, and nor was it uh, penalized for those that didn't participate and advance our interests in this regard. Now it's memorialized and included in a formal document, and to the extent you don't advance your goals, then that will certainly impact you from a compensation perspective, mm. and I think that's very compelling. So it's not only uh, rewarding or penalizing, but holding individuals accountable for success in terms of their goals and what they endeavor to do in this regard. I just want to add that everything that the panelists have said and, and echo all of it, but one of the things that we're seeing more for some of our corporate, at least our clients, are formal mentoring programs. Um, a lot of times people say, you know, Mentoring is important. It's important for it to happen organically, but it doesn't always happen organically, especially for women and sort of people of color. And so it's important that we sort of look at what type of programs we have in our companies. And MetLife recently announced they have a formal mentoring program within their organization, but now they're requiring their outside counsel to submit to them a formal plan of how you are mentoring your attorneys of color within your firm. Wow. They will review the plan with you and follow up with you in terms of accountability of how is this person succeeding? It's not just are you mentoring, but what is the success of your mentee? So that accountability factor is coming back. So you're going to start to see, I think, more of more organizations that are doing that and then more organizations holding their clients or for us, our, their outside counsel accountable for that mentoring. How about that? That's very interesting. Sir. Hi, morning. Hi, Sheena. Hi. <laughs> uh, we went to school together. Uh, I'm very proud of her. You've heard of the beehive. I'm part of the she-hive. So. Uh, I'm also, I'm also, I'm also. You're not losing that one. Thank you for that. 
I'm also on the same alumni committee with Ursula Burns. I watched her rise as well. We're part of the engineering team at Columbia. So I've heard this 10 years ago. I spent 10 years in diversity at City. I heard this 10 years ago. I've heard it five years ago. Today, I'm going to one of the tech companies, uh, Google. If you saw the pre-market in terms of scorecard and metrics, all of them are showing double profits. But when you look at their diversity, I mean, this room, when I get there, they don't look anyone in this room. They got last names with double vowels and long and 16 characters. Where do we go from here knowing that the metrics is showing that you don't have to be diversified in order to make great profits? And how do you move the conversation from 10 years ago, 10 years into the future? Hmm. Be being from Haiti, I kind of have a lot of vowels in my name as well. <laughs> Um, I guess I would, let me, let me just start with one quick comment is, you know, you don't always know that, and that doesn't mean that people haven't been wildly successful, um, based on their current complement. and think about, um, the late sixties, early seventies with the, the think IBM high heydays about conformity and conformity was a winning proposition for them for many, many years. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's always going to be a winning proposition, and you don't really know what innovation is going to be required for the future. You don't know what your customer base is going to look like in the future, um, and and things are moving very quickly. So um, I, I think it's it's also um, a, just a wise perspective to look in a, in a broader fashion for the future. So I think that's where a number of companies that I certainly spend time with behind the scenes are thinking about, even though they've been wildly successful to date, and I know many that are not in the tech space that are um, significantly homogeneous and have been wildly successful, but are also saying, I don't know that this is um, going to be a long-term strategy for us. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that it's not sustainable as well. When I Just to unpack that uh, statistic I threw out there earlier today um, about that 410% increase in multicultural buying power, that's $3.4 trillion. Um, and that was back in two, 2015. So I think part of it, I'm gonna put my social justice cap on, part of this is actually at the grassroots level for people of color, for women, for all parts of diverse backgrounds, owning their buying power. So part of this is also holding companies accountable, and especially as we live, move into this more millennial uh, dominant economy that is more of an emotional or ethos economy, where our purpose economy, where millennials are looking at brands and unpacking those brands based upon their uh, social responsibility, based upon their diversity and inclusion, we're going to have, we're going to see these companies get hit harder. And that's why it's important for companies now to demonstrate the moral courage and fortitude necessary to say this is the right thing to do. Moreover, when we look at the global economy, it's our most valuable asset, diverse talent. We are a microcosm as America of the global economy. So the better we can get to, uh, figure out how to optimize every iota of human capital in our country, the better we will be. The larger issue that we have is fear. As a country, we have uh, accelerated past just the healing process um, that is endemic of what Sheena talked about historically. We have not done any reconciliation in this country about our past, around the sexism and racism. We can take a book, uh, a page out of Germany's book that did some severe, deep reconciliation in order to start to build and heal some of the tensions. We moved past that and we forget that we're a young country in a global society. We're very young. We're Barely a teenager compared to some of, uh, you're talking about millennials in the workplace, you know, America <laughs> as a millennial. That's um, really, with a, with a president that acts up at the UN. You know, but if we really have to think about <laughs> us really, really leapfrogging processes necessary to actually sustaining and integrating these values into the fabric of the country. And we have not done that. So part of this is us taking a pause and really grappling with the issues that are still looking back at us in the mirror. If I could just I, I pull out a couple of things that Jeffrey said and underline them and underscore them, it's very important. Um, you know, one, kind of our, our history. I, I remember I was in London and I was telling someone I was majoring in American history and they're like, what's that? You don't have enough history. What? Like, what did you take? Like, you did that in a semester? I was like, no, that's a real thing. Uh, but, you know, kind of, we are a young country still and there is a lot to do and learn. And just, I mean, 
the tech space. Um, my son is graduating this year from University of Chicago, computer science, physics, going into the a tech world. And I got to see his grown up life over the summer in Silicon Valley. And I was really taken by the fact that there were, there were just no women anywhere. I mean, it is, it, it's, it's shocking. I mean, and you know, the biggest, you know, highest market cap companies in our country right now, I mean, they're so unbelievably um, just not diverse in so many ways. And I think your point of, but the consumers, right, that use all of these companies and, and buy this technology is a diverse space. And, and we do have to be more thoughtful about that and that they're not going to say, oh, if we had more women, we would be better. I think they feel pretty good about where they are. But if our consumers are making a demand and saying, you know, this is important, you have to be corporately socially responsible um, in order to get my hard-earned money for your product. And that's where the pressure is going to have to come. So there is power in that. And everybody has some power with regard to that. Okay, we are coming down the home stretch. Um, I want to um, ask each panelist to um, briefly answer um, uh, a, a big question that uh, for the folks who are here, if their company was to do just one thing going forward to advance diversity and inclusion, well, what should it be? I think we all have to focus on the pipeline. Uh, I think you just right back to that tech question, and, and I think the work that United Way is doing in terms of the holistic approach is, is that pipeline and making sure that we're going to have the future engineers there. Right now, a lot of our youth, because we're not used to having those role models, they don't see themselves in that space. So we have to tell them this is an opportunity and this is an option for you. So I think every company that is looking to have a diverse workforce looks has to look at their pipeline and say, do I have that pipeline? If I don't have that pipeline, what work can I do to create a pipeline for me? And not just think about what's coming in the next five years, but what's coming in the next 15, 20 years when those young elementary school kids are going up and making decisions as to what career path am I going to take? They need to know that you are an option for them. And that is by you investing time and energy in either companies like United Way that are doing the work or finding a way for you to work with um, growing that pipeline. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's owning the the reality that exceptionalism is the worst enemy of equity. We look at some of the Ursula Burns, Sheena Wright, and myself, some people that have risen out of poverty into a level of, of, of prosperity and, 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 and influence and think that, well, if she did it, then everyone else should be able to do it. But it also, we have to think about the investments in just the ecosystem again from the educational environment to access to healthcare, access to healthy foods, access to knowledge and the internet, all of these things actually play into human development. And if we're actually worried about the pipeline and human capital associated with that, then we also have to right-size policies. We also have to right-size practice around ensuring those that are starting far beyond um, the start line in order to catch up in the race that we make that important. So companies being intentional about investments that are going to yield more equitable outcomes across their talent pipeline is critical. Um, and being able to connect that back to a return on investment, I think it's critical that companies measure what matters as it relates to their DNI index. So I think I'll just take a different tactic and maybe go towards the individual level versus the macro organizational level. And something that I would um, suggest people consider doing and, and that we do in-house is what we call PTR. So when anybody's making any type of decision, hiring, um, equity, advancement, assignments, whatever it might be, to focus on what's the PTR is preference tradition requirement. Focus on what is really required not preferences, not historical traditions, not how it's always been or the person always looked like or the incumbent beforehand to focus on what's required for the future. And then the second piece would be to um, uh, ask for advice more than you give advice. Mm -hmm. I, I would suggest that uh, we as an organization continue to support, to sponsor, to mentor our people and encourage them to participate in varying activities. I think academia is critically important, and we, so we need to show up. We need to be role models. We need to make individuals, students, understand that they can, in fact, achieve success. Make them aware of the different professions that are out there. Um, it, it's really just continued mentorship, sponsorship, and encouragement of our people in terms of them being their authentic selves. 
And I'm going to uh, answer that question by example. Um, include diverse voices. This man has had his hand up the whole entire time, and I want him to ask his question. I mean, he is a, 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 it's a different voice, and I, would, I definitely think we want and need to hear it. Thank you very much. Uh, Nick Chapman, I'm uh, part of an organization called Virtual Enterprises. We've been proud to work with Deloitte for over 18 years, uh, engaging over 600 employees. But my question is, uh, and, and I think it changed when we, we talked about pipeline and education just a moment ago, but last night my three-year-old son was out at Halloween, um, and to a three-year-old, um, there, there's no race. There's, there's only cool costumes, right? Um, so what are the lessons that we can take from those three, four, five, six-year-olds? Jeffrey mentioned that um, children under the age of nine are growing up in a, in a, in a, you know, in, in a uh, minority majority. Um, what are the lessons we can take from them? They're entering high school, middle school, careers. How do we have that conversation so we're not repeating the conversation 10 years from now? Well, I mean, the biggest thing, and we've been, this has been a salient theme across all the comments today, is curiosity is what we can learn from our young people, is that I have a nephew that's nine, uh, eight years old, and his biggest question is why? <laughs> like, why, why? And back in the day, we was like, because I told you so. But now, you know, you have to really unpack that for them. And I think that we really have to put back on that, that, that cap of curiosity, our thinking cap related to really understanding and seeking understanding from our neighbors. Because part of the way that we act, the unconscious biases, is how we have actually been programmed to think based upon the market forces or societal forces as well. So we have to unlearn that. And I think starting that journey is just being curious and inquisitive around how things operate for other people from different perspectives. OK. Um, a little, little bit of a choreography here. I want you to um, join me in thanking our panel. They're going to sort of move to the back. And um, thank you all for a, a great discussion. Uh, and some will be around. Many will be around. I know some people have to dash out. Others don't. And there'll be a little coffee and discussion time uh, as well. Uh, for closing remarks, we're going to be joined by Dipti Gulati, who's a partner here at Deloitte, as well as a board member of the United Way of New York. Thank you. How are you? Hi. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming here this morning. I know it was an early start, but it was clear that we had a lot of great dialogue, a lot of great discussions. I just want to reinforce what Steve Benici, my partner, said earlier on. You know, we at Deloitte are so supportive of everything that we do around inclusion. It's obvious we've made a lot of progress, but it's obvious we have a long way to go. Um, so I think it's really helpful to get all of you as leaders involved and engaged. Thank you. In the conversation. I'm glad, Nick, you had a chance to, to talk. Um, we are so supportive of all the work that you do at Virtual Enterprise. And, you know, we believe that starting kind of at the younger level and working with high school students is really a great way to help us solve, you know, some of the issues that we've been talking about. So thanks again for coming.